tell me a little, you know what, I went to your website before I ask you to tell me a little about yourself. I went to your website and I love the stories that you have on your blog with your wife. Oh, thank you. And all the experiences that you've had. And I'm, I'm just so glad that you're able to share these stories, you know, both in your podcast as well as yeah. um, in your blog. Um, it was so interesting. I'm just, lit- I was lit- literally blown away. I, well, you know, I, am, I am now doing a course, six-week course on amava.com. Okay. On So you want to be an expat? Mm-hmm. And it's not telling you how to do it. Okay. It's telling you all the things you have to con- take in consideration. Okay. Right? Um, I'll, I'll use the example of uh, healthcare. Okay. Everyone in the U.S., I won't say everyone, a lot of people in the U.S., all of their assumptions about how healthcare is provided and paid for is based on the experiences in the U S yeah. The problem is nobody does it like the, the U S does nobody. Mm -hmm. And so when people start coming up with all these assumptions and it's like, they're all wrong. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, (laughs) <laughs> and um, I have I have a whole chapter in my book called MSU disorder, and oh. MSU MSU stands for make stuff up. Make stuff up, okay. <laughs> right. Good to know. When we have a void in our knowledge, we tend to fill it with what we think it's supposed to be, and and that usually is making stuff up. Yeah. Well, wow. Well, um, tell me a little bit about yourself. Sure. Um, I am a recovering engineer. Yes, there's a 12-step program for that. Um, I started my career, I I, I was raised by a very highly educated family in New Jersey. I was highly learning disabled. Uh, When I graduated from high school in the 70s, I could barely read. Mm -hmm. Um, but I went off to Northwestern's engineering school and graduated in three and a half years without ever taking an English course, okay. which means I am a highly, highly intelligent learning disabled person. And um, so I then went off and went to work for IBM, the Borg. I was assimilated. Resistance was futile. And I wandered around a lot. Um and this has been true of my, in most of my career and my life, I tend to get bored after a while. And so um, I went from being a word processor program to being a tester to eventually uh, in the 1980s, I was pulling drafting boards away from mechanical engineers and putting them on big CAD cam screens. Um, I then got into engineering workstation got into training Uh, From training, I went into sales Um, in, in that same time. I've, I've um, back in the early nineties, I ruptured the L4, L5 disc in my back and uh, spent three months in bed and uh, very good experience uh, because it forced me to change a lot of stuff. Okay. Um, And um, when stayed, I was in a briefing center, so I'm, I became a very polished uh, professional speaker. Uh, I was, I I, I became what I refer to as a geek that could speak uh, or an articulate techno weenie, which we know is an oxymoron. Um, And went off and um, then IBM screwed me in 99 on my pension and I gave them the single finger salute and went to work for a successful tech star, a semiconductor startup that was acquired by Lucent and Lucent was the sister of the Borg. That was the old uh, equipment arm of, of AT&T most screwed up company you've ever seen in your life. Um, and that's when I had my second life changing event. And that was when I hit, I, I, in two, July 11th of 2002, I hit a car head on, on my bicycle, not a motorbike on my bicycle where our combined speeds exceeded 50 miles an hour. Um, all things considered, I wasn't badly hurt. I spent five days in the trauma center, 
I tore up a knee. I broke a hip. I dislocated the shoulder. I broke a bunch of ribs. I broke the clavicle. I had imprints of the pads of the helmet in my head, but I had no internal injuries and no brain injuries I'm willing to admit to. And I had, um, uh, they had me walking on crutches in three days. They just threw three titanium screws in my hip and had me up, not steel, but titanium. Mm-hmm. You know, got to be high tech here. Mm-hmm. Uh, they had me back on a bike in 10 weeks. And I was flying back to China in four months. And oh, by the way, I flew into Guangdong province of November of 2002, which was the epicenter of SARS V1. In hindsight, I knew all kinds of people around me got sick. Um, and um, I was there for three days to train Huawei, you know, the one of the bad boys of China, and, um, and flew out, flew to Shanghai, and we went to Nanjing and went over to Seoul and discovering other people that were getting sick. And... Um, as I claim, I've been in the wrong place at the wrong time, numerous times in my life. Mm-hmm. Um, and that was one of them. But um, that got me to realize that, you know what? Why the hell am I doing this? I was 46. Um, the first tech startup didn't leave us debt. F- it didn't leave us rich, but left us debt free. I was able to pay off the house. I was able to fund my son's college education. Um, and my son graduated from high school two weeks before I had the bike accident. And so, um, by the way, that summer he was home with me as I rehabbed and we had all kinds of great conversations like, oh, you're going to college. You You can eat like crap or you can eat healthy. It's your choice. Your first college roommate, Mm -hmm. not going to be your best buddy. The odds of throwing two 18-year-old boys in the same room and them hitting off perfectly is almost zero. But you got to respect each other's privacy. Yep. Right? And we had all those conversations that summer. And what I learned four years later, he went to the University of Dayton, is he actually listened. Surprise, surprise. (laughs) Well, yep. with teenage boys, I get the impression you, you've had one or you have one. I have uh, seven kids. I have, um, I have two adults and, I, and four teenagers in my house right now. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> yep. So I know what you're talking about. Yeah. Okay. I mean, you, you can talk to them and you have no idea what sticks. Oh, yeah, definitely. So I actually, having the bike accident was actually a blessed event. Cause I wouldn't have had the time with them. Mm-hmm. And so it's, um, but that for that, that got me to go off and teach high school math for a couple of years. Um, I couldn't do that and stay healthy. Um, I thought I was an extrovert. I was not, I'm a big time introvert. It exhausted me. Most of us are. <laughs> yep. And, um, and, and I also, I've been all over the world. I've adapted so many cultures. One of the things, I was in an inner city high school in Austin where, you know, the school on average, probably 70% of my kids, 60% of the kids were economically disadvantaged. In my classroom, it was probably 90 to 95%. Wow. So I was, I had to learn another culture, a culture of poverty. And I had, I've had some bizarre experiences in the past. I got it, but it took me a while to realize. Um, and it also, I was highly successful. Although there were kids I couldn't help. I couldn't fix the, cause their problems were not in the classroom. They were outside the classroom. Yeah. And so after two years, I was exhausted. Um, I ended up going doing a one year stint uh, at a nonprofit. I, I joke, I, um, I, I developed, I started to work on a corporate development program for the Jewish, Jewish Community Association of Austin. And I, I joke is being a non-Jew, being the face of a Jewish organization is interesting. Well, they might be I, <laughs> I grew up in an entirely Jewish neighborhood in New Jersey. So I understood it. 
but it was, and I still have people today look at my profile. Oh, you must be Jewish. And say, the answer is nope. Then they're going, really? Yeah, well, um, I then got sucked up into another startup, uh, Life Size Communications, which, by the way, is a predecessor to Zoom. Um, so if you want to understand how all this video works, I can explain. I built a training and certification program. Oh, cool. um, we once again got bought out by, we got acquired by Logitech and uh, the, it got really ugly. And uh, I started Career Pivot. I started looking at doing Career Pivot in, in the 2008, 2009 timeframe. Cause I was on, a, uh, I was on the board of a non of a nonprofit, um, uh, job club. And, you know, I was looking at 2008, 2009, our, our meetings were just exploding. We were getting 400 people every, every Friday and they were all my age. Okay. They were in their forties and fifties. And I started looking at saying, well, who really is dealing with this age demographic. Mm -hmm. And the answer is no one, because we're all going to retire. Yeah. Well, the reality is right now, about 80% of my cohort cannot afford to retire. That's a uh, right. Mm -hmm. So uh, I started career pivot. I launched the brand in 2012. I, um, I just built it as a standard coaching practice uh, based off behavioral assessments. Um, was very six was was it was growing every year, and then October of 2016, I got my October surprise. It had nothing to do with Hillary Clinton. Um, my healthcare, my health insurance exploded. Okay. Uh, and um, we went from um, eleven hundred dollars a month for my wife and I to eighteen hundred dollars a month. Wow! Wow! And I said, "This is ridiculous." Full hockey. Mm -hmm. uh, so we started looking at being expats. Um, we always, I always thought that we would. Um, early in my career, I thought my employer would move me overseas and we would do this, and that never happened. And um, so we, we started looking at, and by the way, in 2017, we spent $25,000 on health insurance and healthcare and didn't reach our deductible. Wow. So, um, in, in, and I started to move my business from being a uh, coaching practice to a membership. Mm-hmm. Because one of the things I learned in, as, as things were progressing, that the people who could afford me were people I didn't want to work with. They were jerks. Um, the people I wanted to work with couldn't afford me. And so that's when I started working on the whole membership model and going online, uh, allowing me to be totally... Um, you know, uh, location independent mm -hmm. and to be able to charge lower fees to, um, so that people could afford me. There you go. Right. And what I learned from my experience with the job club was it was as much about the community that got people to go as it was about, Kathy and my other compatriots who ran the job club, right? It was, it was, you know, it takes a village to raise a child. Well, it takes a village to get someone through uh, late stage layoffs and getting people to realize that they need to uh, look at the world differently. Um, I'm, this is one of the things I believe big time going as we come out of, uh, out of this pandemic, I'm 64. I've got a lot of people who I'm working with where we're trying to reshape their heads to realize that the world that they came from doesn't exist anymore. So what are you going to do about it? And that 
for many of these people, it means they may never go back to full-time employment. Uh, but by the way, I don't want to go back to full-time employment ever again. I don't want to work for somebody again. And um, so I, you know, my current community has about 45 members. Okay. And, you know, I've, I've developed, I got multiple revenue streams, including my books. I'm on, now in my third edition of repurpose your career. Um, and um, yeah, it's, it's, um, it's been a learning experience. Which is why you bring a lot of uh, wealth of information to this interview. Yeah. Um, I, I noticed that your background was very um, diverse and that you'd um, done a lot of different things. You have, you, you have the blog, you have the podcast, um, I, and you have other resources, including your books, your um, training materials and, um, and so on. So um, I was doing this post to help my audience um, or open up podcasting to my audience yep. and uh, as, as well as myself, because um, I run into so many people that say, why don't you have a podcast? And I'm like, well, I haven't really thought about it. I haven't thought about that, it that deep, you know? But once I started talking to people about it, I could find the value in, you know, starting one, but I wanted to know everything about it. You You'll know. never know everything about it. Know that. Before you, yeah. Um, Every if time you I talk to somebody, I learn something new. And I'm like, wow, there is so much to learn. Listen to my last podcast episode I did with Diane Wingert. Uh, it was on mindset. And Diane's in the SBI community. Okay. And Diane said one thing that stuck with me. And that is, you have to be ready to start things before you're ready. Very true, <laughs> very true. And but I have an audience. Um, my, my blog um, teaches b different online business models yep. as well as offline. So I have an audience that I need to know everything or as much of everything as I can in order to help my audience. So, you know, so I do try to learn <laughs> as much as I can, even though I know I can get started right away. Yes. I always try to learn more than I have to. So tell me, how did you get into podcasting? Okay. Well, let me first state the fact that um, when I, I've helped people start podcasts, I'm helping several people start, uh, sorry, have helped several people start blogs and podcasts. And I will tell you, your first stuff will suck. That's fine. You can delete it. Um, the second thing is what I tell people is go do it and then listen. Because what you think they want is MSU. Right? You're making stuff up. It's, you know, and so um, I'm being a recovering engineer, I do stuff and then I measure. I've talked to a number of podcasts. I want to grow my audience. Fine. What are your download numbers? Well, I don't know. Well, how do you know it's not growing now? Exactly. <laughs> uh, can you go back and look at your podcast numbers and say, and look at which ones did better than others? So I started out with the podcast in late 2016, actually end of October, 2016, to support the launch of my second edition of Repurpose Your Career. And I mean, that was the purpose of it. And um, did it really help? The answer is, I don't know. Um, I got booked on a lot of podcasts. I paid a booker to book me on those podcasts and did that do anything? And I'm personally, I think not really. Um, and I'm a very good, good inter I'm a very good interviewee. I am not a good interviewer. And people now say, Oh, Mark, you're really good. And I said, no, I'm really good at editing my verbal vomit out. 
when you're talking to me and I'm telling you my story, I've been a professional speaker. I know how to do that. When I have to listen to you and have a conversation with you, I very often will end up thinking at the same time I'm talking and I stutter. I bleh, 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 bleh. Now I can edit it. I'm good at editing my audio. And I know to repeat stuff. Um, but so, so what you'll find is some of my early episodes, my first one's horrible because it was a solo episode and I still find doing solo episodes difficult. Uh, the second one and second, third, and fourth, uh, the audio quality wasn't great. I eventually figured out um, how to do the, the audio. Um, I, by the way, I use a product called Alphonic. Uh, which does noise, audio leveling, noise reduction. It's cheap. You get two hours free a month. Um, and so, yes, I, I, and so, but one of the things you find is like anything else, as you do more, you get better at the craft. I now record over Zoom and I have to see you. It's very difficult for me to have a conversation with you over, say, Skype with no video. So you've, you've given me quite um, a lot of information so far. And um, yours has been one of the more successful podcasts that, yes. um, that I've, I've seen out there. I've seen a lot of people that... Um, that do podcasting as a full-time business, but you know, you've been extremely successful doing um, podcasting. Tell me what your secret is. What's your, how, what is your process that makes you more successful than other possible? Um, I think it's because uh, number one, I listen. Two, I'm persistent. Um, you know, it, it's kind of like uh, my blog, it grew and grew and grew and grew until 2019 when it got attacked oh. um i had somebody a resume writer generate literally tens of thousands of spammy links to it and then and then the pandemic hit mm -hmm. um but it's it's paying attention and then going okay it's kind of like i said I, I when uh when i had um uh when i had john tarnoff on i said well let's just try this and people really, it was real obvious. People really liked it. Yeah. Um, similar. I had Diane Wingard on um, in December, the last episode of December. And we just talked about how to change mindset. Okay. And um, that came and And with Diane, there have been several times where we'll get into this discussion and she'll ask me a question. I'll respond and we'll get going down a certain path. And she'll go, wow, we didn't rehearse this. And this is really good. Um, you find there are certain people that if I hear a particular topic that I'm going, this is, it isn't necessarily what people want to hear, but it, what, it's what they have to hear. What they have to hear. Okay. It's it's kind of like right now. I, I I'm developing a um, a presentation for job clubs on um, on disruption because there's a ton of disruption going on, and I did it for my job club back in Austin, and I, I got a lot of good feedback. And it's a depressing topic, and I you know they they came back energized. Now, but these are people I know. I should say the, 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 the people who run the job club. Okay. Now I'm taking it to some other job clubs that don't know me. Okay. And they're pushing back. These people don't want to hear this. And it's like, yes, I understand. They don't want to hear it, okay. but they have to hear it. Wow. Right. And, um, and so I'm, again, I'm learning. I need to rechain. I have to re swizzle my approach to um, get people to understand 
that the world we're going to look at, particularly in the second half of 2021, doesn't look like 2019. No, it doesn't. At all. And if you're out of work and you're in your late 50s, you're going to have to do some really hard work if you want to keep working. And so I'll use the example. I had Fawn Germer, who was at, she's out selling her book coming back. The goodness is I've done enough podcasts now with enough good. I get all kinds of people pitching their books. I mean, I get a lot. In fact, I get pitched five times a day. I mean, most of them are horrible. I mean, I should say most of them just aren't on target. Um, but, <clears throat> but, you know, I remember back in 2018 when we were gone for the summer, we came down here for the summer and I came back after actually more like four and a half months. Mm-hmm. And I had five books mailed to my condo in Austin, totally unsolicited. And it's like, wow. (laughs) Now, people should know not to do that because if they mailed it to me in Mexico, I probably would never get it. Mm -hmm. And if I did, it costs me every time someone gets it because I I have them ship it to a receiver service, which I have to pay every time I get something. Um, So it's... um, So like right now, I have people pitch me. And the first thing I do is saying, send me your book. Send it to me electronically. Don't try and send me a physical book. And then I can look at it and then say, hmm. And I said, Fawn's was really good because it was really frank. Mm -hmm. And her one chapter on experience is dead. It's all about relevance. Okay. Well, people my age in your fifties and sixties, <coughs> I've got 30 and 40 years of experience. Oh yeah. <laughs> but no one gives a crap if it's not relevant. If it's not relevant so. <coughs> and so it's learning to reshape. It's kind of like, well, it's in it's kind of like my mastermind group in SBI. Um, we, we, I had several people look at my website and one of them, Mena, looked at it and she was being very gentle. And I said, Mena, if you think my baby's ugly, tell me. Just tell me. And I had put ads on it and the ads had gotten, and she was looking at mobile and I moved to convert kit. And, and there were a number, there were a bunch of things wrong, but until someone tells me, <coughs> it's my baby. I'm up. I am, I am a really poor judge of how other people view it. Yeah. So it was interesting. I, you know, I've since with several people who I've been talking to about this presentation, I've said, if you think my baby's ugly, tell me and why. And, um, you know, and it's like with this one group up in Minnesota I was talking to, I could see in his body language on Zoom. He was. Mm, this won't be received well. It's like, that's not what they want to hear. It's what they need to hear. It's what they need to hear. And, I'll, and I will give you things that you can go do. So that's, is that the approach that you take with your podcasts? The, it's yes. not what you want to hear, but yes. what you need to hear. Okay. Yep. And that I'll, sets I'll, I'll, I'll use the example. Uh, I got approached by Glenn Zweig on, um, he, he has the Art of Excellence podcast, really phenomenal podcast. I mean, he gets the CEO of Stripe and he's had Deepak Chopper on there and he's had the CEO of Whole Foods. And I said, wow, you get all these really high profile people. And he says, yeah, but Barack Obama turned me down. <laughs> uh, you know, he says, he just didn't think it was worth his time. What can I say? Anyway, um, I had Glenn talk about how do you switch industries? 
And he gave some real nuggets that I continue to use. And, um, and so, and, and he's the kind of people now I can go back to because we, my podcast has been my greatest networking that I've ever had. 